Plotnik was okay, according to the doctor who made the house call. For once, the ventilation system worked in our favor. We heard everything. There was no concussion, just a little bruise that would fade in a few days. Apparently, he was as hard-headed as he was hard-hearted. The post-revenge victory party that night in apartment 2C was subdued. We had the stereo cranked way up. That was just sound interference, so Plotnik couldn't listen in. After all, a window had been broken today, and if he found out it was us, pretty soon there'd be a 90-story office tower at 1 Pitt Street, and we'd have to pay for it. We were listening to a tape of root beer on the harp made for our enjoyment. People normally think of the harp as a quiet instrument, but that reverberating plink plink gets inside your guts and vibrates them. Maybe root beer was avoiding executive burnout, but the rest of us were going crazy. Luck, said Ferguson. Plotnik's okay, so all he's lost is a window, which was rotten of us, but we didn't do it on purpose. And the money he has to spend to fix it, he's already extorted from us when he redid the stairs, so we're even. I nodded. Plotnik's earned everything he gets and more, but... But I feel like I took that hubcap, hit him over the head with it, and tossed it through his window. Bashing stuff up is almost vandalism. We can't get much lower than that. I winced. We deserve this music. Eh, I wouldn't go that far, said Ferguson. I enjoyed every minute of it, announced Don. Not because of Plotnik's head or the window, but because Peach Fuzz thought it up, planned the whole thing, and it didn't work. I mean, if this hadn't happened, we might have never lived to see his royal fuzziness mess up. You're not going to let me forget this, are you, said the peach. Absolutely not, Don beamed. Let it be known to one and all that on this date, A.D. 1990, at approximately 20 minutes to 8 p.m. in the city of Toronto, country of Canada, continent of North America, planet Earth, orbit 3, solar system 60609, the great doctor of physiology made a mistake. Every year on this anniversary, expect to hear from me, Peach Fuzz, to remind you that the guys who built Stonehenge never would have screwed up like this. Blessed events aside, I cut in. I feel pretty lousy about it. Revenge is overrated, agreed Ferguson. We felt so guilty that when the tape ended, we almost played it again. Almost. Instead, we huddled around the air vent, listening for sounds from the deli. Plotnik seemed to be his normal, nasty self. But when the man from the 24-hour glass replacement company told him the new window would cost $330, he hit the ceiling. We felt like murderers. We'll give him the money, I said suddenly. You mean confess? Of course not. We'll just, pay, put, we'll just put 330 bucks in an envelope and slide under his door after he's gone to sleep. He'll never know who did it. I turned to the peach. You cashed your paycheck, right? Giving him money goes against the grain, said Ferguson, nodding sadly. You know he'll, all, he'll get it all anyway, so why speed the process? Plotnik doesn't deserve two cents, I acknowledged. But our consciences are worth more than 330 bucks. To see Peach Fuzz make a mistake, grinned Don, I'll gladly hand over a million. With our consciences clear, we slept till almost noon. Then we headed down to the deli to eat a la Plotnik. After all, we'd prepaid the tip, $330, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Suddenly, Plotnik was all smiles, and the nickel-sized bruise on his forehead looked more like a Bozo the Clown polka dot than a wound. He was laughing and joking with his customers, and full table service was restored, in spite of the fact that Gourmet Week still had one big night to go. The new window was already installed, spotless and gleaming. We all looked our fill. Not only was it ours, but this was also probably the only chance we'd have to see it clean. Even though our landlord... I felt good about our decision to pay the money. Even though our landlord was a first-class stinker, 
He was an old man, not rich, hardworking, and let's face it, what you owe, you owe. A very good morning to you, gentlemen, a beautiful morning. Hi, Mr. Plotnik, I managed. How are you feeling? Very well, the landlord beamed, rubbing his hands together with glee. I had a visit last night from the shoemaker's elves. Magic elves, very generous. Maybe with a little bit of guilt on the conscience. He knows, whispered John and Don in horror. He can't, I hissed. If he did, he'd be killing us right now. Plotnik brought three coffees to our booth. Very good boys, these elves. One of them, a klutz, fell on the stairs. I was worried for him. That was me, gasped Don as Plotnik walked away. He does so know. Then why is he smiling, whispered Ferguson. As if on cue, a tall man in a business suit rushed into the deli, leaving his car running outside. Great news, Mr. Plotnik. The insurance company is paying in full. He handed over an envelope. Here's your check, $330. He rushed out and drove away. In our booth, we turned to stone. Now we knew why Plotnik was at peace with the world. Between our, conscious, our consciences and his insurance, he'd been paid for the window twice. No wonder you're in such a good mood, I managed to choke out. Oh, that has nothing to do with it, said the landlord self-righteously. I'm always happy when the first of the month is coming. The first of the month? When? Ah, oh, you've forgotten, Mr. Cardone. Wednesday, that's when. We, w we got up and ran straight upstairs to count our financial resources. I did the stairs in record time and pounced on our checkbook. Figures don't lie, no matter how you try to juggle them. We didn't have enough money for the August rent. Hoping for a mistake, I counted our assets. For a lousy planner, I was a great accountant. We had $75 in cash, 200 or so in the bank, and we were facing a $685 rent check. I got so freaked out that my eyes unfocused and the room was a blur. I just said, oh. Then there was Don. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? There's no payday between now and Wednesday. Even Ferguson was unnerved. We're in big trouble. It's all your fault, Peach Fuzz, Don accused. You and your stupid mistake. The real mistake wasn't the hubcap, said Ferguson tersely. It was the money. Or you, Jason, Don exploded. What's that dumb checkbook for, doodles? Why didn't you warn us we didn't have enough money for the rent? I made a mistake, I babbled. Another mistake. I'm surrounded by mistakes. What are we going to do? We could always ask our parents to front us the money, suggested Ferguson. No way, I said. My folks will look at it as an excuse to drag me home. Mine too, said Don. No more stupid ideas, Peach Fuzz. You're the big executive. Why aren't you rich? Because I didn't let Plotnik be my manager, Ferguson snapped. Root beer, I exclaimed. He's our only hope. He has less than we do, said Don, even with the toilet brush. He's got the harp, I argued. He can hock it. We looked over at Root Beer's corner. There sat his paper bag of underwear with the knitting needle, stamp albums, Parcheesi game, and his other discarded harp hobbies. The harp was gone. Oh no, moaned Don. Could it have been stolen? Are you crazy, returned Ferguson. Only King Kong could steal that harp. He's hawking it, I exclaimed. We're saved. Not necessarily, said the Peach. What if he got another hobby? We fought out about it all afternoon, and no matter how we sliced it, it all came up root beer. Not that we were so thrilled about asking the universal dispenser of bad luck to hand over his hard-earned cash. The entire summer, which I now knew was not the sunshine and roses that the boy from Owen Sound thought it would be, had come down to $685 we didn't have. There were problems. One, what if Root Beer said no? Two, what if Root Beer got mad? Three, where was Root Beer? 
With a flaky guy like him, see you later, could mean a 20 minute absence or a trip around the world. Being behind the financial eight ball, we had two dates with Jessica to cancel. Don blew off his afternoon rendezvous with a phony sore throat. Ten minutes later, Ferguson called the weasel out of the evening slot and confessed the whole thing to Don's dismay. Jessica offered her life savings, 38 bucks, but manfully they turned her down. I would have taken it, but she never offered it to me. I can't believe you, Peach Fuzz, roared Don. Why'd you have to make it look like I told her a lie? Because you did. And you should have backed me up. You should have said you caught my sore throat. A sore throat isn't very creative, Ferguson decided. People expect more of me. Maybe pellagra, elephantitis, scurvy. So next time, you pick the disease. Then, perfect timing, my mother called. Hi, dear. How's everything? Great. Terrible. What's new? Nothing. Bankruptcy, eviction, death. In the background, Ferguson and Don were starting to fight again. Jason, what's that noise? It sounds like an argument. Uh, no, Mom. We're watching a war movie on TV. How are Ferguson and Don? Fine, I said, stepping in between them. They both send their regards. Hi, Mrs. Cardone, they called in the receiver, and then resumed their bickering. So, are you going someplace fun today? Oh, sure, the street with all of Joe's furniture. That's lovely, dear. Your father wants to say hello. My dad came on. Hi, son, flat broke yet? Ha, ha, ha. No way, dad. At least not until Wednesday. I ran into Doug Champion at the bowling alley last night, and we, we talked about how proud we are of you kids. We had our doubts, but you're sure showing us. Keep it up, son. So long. Bye, Dad. Grimly, we settled in to wait for root beer. He came at four in the morning and was greeted by three very light sleepers. My hopes were dashed almost immediately. He was carrying the Betelgeuse T5000 Deluxe High Magnification Telescope. It looked expensive. It looked like the August rent. I was too frazzled for tact. You have to return it! I could do, I could do that, said Rootbeer thoughtfully, but they might not like it too much at back at the store. It's a little broken. How broken? asked Don fearfully. The telescope's okay, Willis Rootbeer assured us, but... All the glass fell out. It's defective. I cried, they have to take it back. Rootbeer looked vaguely ashamed. Well, it kind of happened when I hit that guy. He then occupied himself with stacking his heart music on top of the stamp albums. Now what? Whispered Ferguson desperately. He's still our only hope, I hissed. Excuse me. He's still our only hope, I hissed. None of the rest of us can come up with fast money. Oh, God, said Ferguson. You're asking the guy to go out and get clobbered by a two-by-four. I shrugged lamely. Maybe he'll just bite tires or something. Look, I wouldn't ask him if there was any other way. Joe's lease is on the line here. I cleared my throat very carefully. Uh, Root Beer, you wouldn't happen to have any money left, would you? Sure! He shook the upper right-hand corner of his poncho, and a shower of coins hit the floor, along with a few elastics and paper clips. He looked down for a quick count. Ah, oh, second thought, I'm broke. How about that? Oh, wow, Root Beer, I moaned. We we've got kind of an emergency. Our rent's due on Wednesday, and we're short more than $400. Root Beer whistled, the longer beard hairs rustling in the breeze. That's a few bucks. Lucky for us, it's carnival season. Just let me grab some Z's. And he flopped right down on the floor and was asleep at once. <laughs>